fairy tale ideas is that we expect it to be magical and that we don't we lose sight of the fact that there are t uh, tools techniques ways of approaching relationship that actually work in that's all right. kinds of relationships not just marriage yeah Rich, it, it sounds point. like that's what you've landed on you've distilled those down yeah and i mean i think i was raised to think uh that, well, as long as you're in love, you know, that's it. You're fine. You, you should be able to figure it out from there. And it, it's really weird to me now looking back, like there was no relationships 101 at any of the schools that I went to. I don't know if they had them at your schools either, but where were we supposed to learn? I think, things? yeah, I had relationship 101. And it was right up there with financial literacy, like, you know, <laughs> that you should right? have more money coming in than going out. That, that They taught me that one too, didn't know. They didn't teach me that one either. And 76% yeah. of all fight, fights and marriages are about money. So it's, it's interesting how those go together. All right. So. Hello and welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today I'm meeting with Laura Doyle, New York Times bestselling author, relationship expert, and podcaster. How are you, Laura? I'm doing great, Rich. You are doing great. And welcome to the show. <laughs> the Laura and I have just met for the first time. We've been like chit-chatting behind the scenes. And we, we were talking. It's like, wait a minute, man, this should be on the podcast. We gotta, yeah. we, we're going to stop chit-chatting. All right, so the yeah. topic today is going to be, is my marriage hopeless, question mark? Um, and that's because I think pretty much everyone feels like that at some point in their marriage. And, mm -hmm. and if they're, they don't, it's possible they're just leading parallel lives and not thinking about it, which, which might lead to that question in the future. But before we really get started on the topic, Laura Doyle. How did your heart lead you into the work that you do helping people with their relationships? Well, um, it was very personal for me. I, I was actually uh, the perfect wife and then I got married and then I wasn't so perfect anymore, but I didn't realize this. I, I didn't understand why my husband didn't really want to spend any time with me and was mm -hmm. more interested in watching reruns than he was in spending, you know, talking to me or even making love to me. But I knew something was wrong with him and I knew what to do to fix it. And that was that I knew I had to take him to marriage counseling. So the counselor could tell him everything he was doing wrong and then make him be better somehow. So that's what I did. I uh, insisted we go. I kind of bulldozed him to go. And um, we were on the marriage counselor's gray couch when I realized my marriage was hopeless and that I was going to have to get divorced or else I was going to spend the rest of my life in a loveless relationship. So, mm. so I decided I would get divorced, but there was just this one problem. And that was, I was too embarrassed because we'd only been married for a few years and everyone had been to the wedding just not that long ago. So I thought, well, as a last ditch effort, I'm going to ask women who have been married for an eternity, which was 15 years, mm -hmm. what their secrets are to having a happy marriage. And so I started doing that. And the things that they said, I thought they were going to say, we well, have to marry the right person, but they didn't say that. They said things that just made my head explode. I didn't even really understand what they meant, some of them. Or I didn't think I could do the things that they were suggesting. I remember one woman said, well, I try not to criticize my husband, mm -hmm. no matter how much it seems like he deserves it. And I was like, hmm. Have you got anything else? Because uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that I can do that. And but I got desperate enough that I decided to start experimenting with all these crazy suggestions. And I remember I'd been doing that for not even that long when I came through the door. I came home, and my husband's face lit up. He was happy to see me again. Nice. And that had been gone. Yeah. So I thought, oh, something, this is, maybe this is working. There's, I'm onto something here. And so I, it was super exciting because I thought, okay, now I know how to have the kind of marriage I, I always wanted so badly. Uh, and I, I know what to do. So I'm just going to do that. And I thought, well, this is going to be great because we're going to, we won't be fighting all the time like we have been. We won't have that wall-to-wall -wall hostility or we used to have cold wars where there was no talking mm -hmm. for days and it was really tense. Like, not that oh, I know anything like, about that. That's I'm just No, you don't know anything about this, I'm sure. No right. identification but, there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So uh so um so then uh we were 
we were in the car. We used to have a lot of fights in the car. Mm. Uh, after I'd been doing my new stuff for a little while, and we had a big fight. We had a huge fight again. And I was so deflated because I thought, oh, I thought that's this wasn't going to happen again because I know what to do. It's like I finally got this beaten. What happened? Yeah, what happened? But then just knowing what to do wasn't enough. I couldn't get myself to do it until I had this idea. I thought, well, if I could recruit some of my girlfriends who are also complaining about their marriages, I'm going to get them to do it with me. And then I'll have like a little support group and we can, we can all do it together. Maybe that'll help. And it, it, it did. I had a little support group in my living room. There were five of us, including me. And um, I started saying, hey, you know, try this or say this or, uh, you know, do this thing. And do you know, we were all experiencing miracles. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. I remember one woman, uh, her husband won the sales contest at work, took her on the most romantic getaway of their lives. Nice. Another woman said, this is not going to seem like a big deal to you guys, but it's a big deal. And she says, we've been fighting about uh, painting the family room for months. And he got up and painted the family room and he did it with a smile. He was like happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And we were like, okay, we are on to something. And then one of the women said, hey, can you write down what we're doing for my cousin in Florida? I'm in California. We were all in California. She's like, she wants to know what we're doing too. Can you write it all down? And I said, okay, sure. That's a good idea. I wrote it down and that became my first book, which ended up going directly to the New York Times bestseller list. It was published in uh, 30 countries in like 22 languages. And congratulations. Uh, yeah, I, I know. It was I know like, that's old news for you, but I always, you know, that's an accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just never expected it from just, I was trying to save my own marriage. Uh, and and it turns out, um, you know, it really resonated for a lot of women. And now, now we have a, you know, coaching organization. I have over a hundred uh, coaches who are experts on the six intimacy skills, which is what I distilled from those wise women that I interviewed about their happy marriages. Sweet, sweet. So it sounds like your heart led you to this work through working through the problem yourself, really coming up against it and very much wanting to have a happy ending. Oh. Well, not, not that you're at an ending yet, but no, but I, I, I have that like, idea that I, like I would have. Ever yeah. After. yeah, yeah. I'm surprised now. I mean, I think I grew up, um, I'm a product of divorced parents. Uh, so that was my role model, right? And that's, I was following a failed recipe and I was getting similar results. I was going to, I was going down that same road. Uh, and so it still is a surprise and a delight to have my marriage be um, my soft place to land, to find out that I'm wonderful and beautiful and uh, and amazing and uh instead of having it be such hard work which is how i was raised marriage was is hard work uh which you know i didn't get married to have like a second job i you know that wasn't what i was in it for uh, i was in it for the the passion and the playfulness you know for the for the laughs for the good times um to have someone to bear witness and um uh, and now that i have all that uh i just want every woman to know these things that they might not have seen modeled growing up either. Yeah. Well, pain is necessary, but suffering is optional. And there's no reason why it, when we're in pain, we can't learn and find a way through it to something better. But if we're not willing to find a way through it, then it gets really, really awful. And we just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over. And uh, it seems to be, we were saying before the call listeners that, uh, pretty much every marriage seems to come up against this at one point or another, uh, you know, or it just comes undone. There's, there's just a point in every marriage where uh, we, it's almost like we're bringing our parents into the room, even though we didn't ever want to be married to them, or maybe we're bringing these ideas about what marriage should be into the room that, that aren't helping. And it's, what's really interesting about this to me is I think there's more to it than that though. Uh, there's like a statistic that arranged marriages are, stay together, like 97% of them stay together. Now, part of that might just be the culture that they're in, but also there's a lot of evidence that people who are in arranged marriages find the tools that they need to have a relationship that works. And so there's a lot of evidence that, that suggests that part of it 
kind of going back to my saying happily ever after is that we've got fairy tale ideas about what marriage should be, you know, and, and uh, what, that, what I mean by fairy tale ideas is that we expect it to be magical and that we don't, we lose sight of the fact that there are t uh, tools, techniques, ways of approaching relationship that actually work in that's all kinds right. of relationships, not just marriage. Yeah, Rich. It, it sounds point. like that's what you've landed on. You've distilled those down. Yeah. And I mean, I think I was raised to think uh, that, well, as long as you're in love, you know, that's it. You're fine. You, you should be able to figure it out from there. And it, it's really weird to me now looking back, like there was no relationships 101 at any of the schools that I went to. I don't know if they had them at your schools either, but we're were we supposed to learn? I think, things? yeah, I had relationship 101. It was right up there with financial literacy, like, you know, <laughs> that you should right? have more money coming in than going out. That, that They taught me that one too. No, they didn't teach me that one either. And 76% yeah. of all fight, fights and marriages are about money. So it's it's interesting how they go together. All right. So yeah. you, you we've all come up against this thing in this marriage. And I'm sure that someone who's listening to this right now is having the, that hopeless experience. Like, why can't he get it? Why won't she change? What What is wrong with them? Uh, and, you know, there there's a whole... There's a whole giving away of power that happens when we go into that place. When we get to that place of blame, you know, first of all, we're there's a huge relief. Like, we make it their problem. It's all their fault. You know, huh, phew, it's off of my shoulders. But also, you know, we've given them all the power in that when we do that. So it's a double-edged sword. It's like we may feel like it's, we have no responsibility, but we also have no, there's nothing we can do. You know, That's we're right. helpless. So that doesn't work. Victims. Um, and so this marriage, yeah. yeah. So what, what are, so, what are, you know, when people are in that place where, and you, typically, by the way, that isn't one-sided, like, you know, both people get up on their self-righteous anger and their blame and they're f tossing it back and forth and it, it just wafting grenades back and forth, or maybe they're nuclear weapons, who knows, you know, how do we, according to the studies that you did and the work you did with these ladies in your living room and your, and your book, what's the first thing we need to do to, to disrupt that pattern? Well, since I only have the experience of being a wife and a woman, uh, everything I share is from that perspective. And I, um, and you can call it yin and yang instead of male and female, whatever you like, right? The, uh, and a, a comparative religious study student once explained to me um, about yin and yang that uh, every object has yin and yang, like a, a coffee cup. I don't have a coffee cup, but anyway, here's my, here's my water. Uh, my water cup, which my husband put a little sticker on there. It says tempered. I'm not sure what cup. that means exactly. Okay, there you go. There's my coffee cup. So the coffee cup, the structure of it, the ceramic part and the handle, that would be the yang or the masculine part, the part that gives it structure. Then that part that receives the coffee that you're pointing to, you're holding up right now beautifully, that's the yin or the feminine, the receptive. And if you think about a coffee cup that can't receive coffee, can't hold coffee, it has no purpose. And so this was really illuminating for me because um, I think I, I think we were talking a little bit before the show that I was very unpleasable. I wouldn't receive things from my husband. And it was because I was so unhappy. Uh, so for instance, he would get me flowers and I would say, oh, you didn't have to do that. That It's kind of a waste. We really can't afford that. It's a waste of money. Um, or he'd buy me a gift and I would say, oh, it didn't fit right. Or um, you know, it was like a purse. Oh, it didn't, I didn't have enough room for all my junk or whatever. And I'd return it. Uh, or he would, um, uh, you know, compliment me. I remember like first thing in the morning, he'd say, Oh, you're so beautiful. And I was like, oh, no, I'm like, don't look at me. You know, I'm, my hair's a mess or whatever. I couldn't receive any of that. And so, um, my, here's my husband trying to do things to, uh, be my hero, to, uh, continue with the wooing process really every day. And I was turning those things away. So mm -hmm. in, a, in a way I was, I was blocking the uh, wonderful cycle that begins in courtship where, um, you know, he's, he would you know, uh, compliment me and I would say, you know, oh, thank you. Oh, you know, uh, that whole thing had come to a scree screeching halt. And part of it was also my own, uh, I came to my marriage with a, a lot of a fear, I didn't realize, that manifested itself as control. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to tell my husband, 
uh, how to improve. I was going to help him improve. I was very helpful, Rich. So I was telling him how to uh, eat better, eat healthier, how he could uh, dress a little better, of course, how to be more ambitious at work. Um, I was helping him with his driving. And as you can imagine, because you're in the future with me now too, this made me like a humorless toothache of a wife that he never wanted to be around. Uh, so he started to avoid me. And then I started to do what I've seen so many experts recommend, which is to explain that I had a deep concern about his lack of affection and attention, which just pushed him further away because that never works, right? Who then it's just more criticism, like, oh yeah, you're you're not being a very good husband. And uh, unbeknownst to me, of course, that's one of my husband's highest priorities in life is to make his wife happy. In fact, I've interviewed thousands of men and as part of my research uh, and asked them, how important is it to you that your wife is happy? In fact, Rich, I've got to ask you that question. How important is it to you that your wife is happy? Um, it's pretty vital, I would say. Pretty uh, yeah, pretty vital. I mean, I've, it's taken me time to learn that I need to charge my own battery first before I, sure. att before I attend to her happiness. And there was a time when I didn't do that. And so I would be attending to her happiness at, at my own, at, at an expense to myself. And then I'd be resentful uh, to her, like completely irrational. It was not her fault even just, you know, it's just, sure. and I think a lot of people do that. I think we give and we give and we give, we forget to plug ourselves in and, you know, it's, get, take care of ourselves. And then we just crash emotionally. So sure, yeah, I, I'd say yes, absolutely. Very important. If you're in a partnership and you love someone, their happiness becomes very primary. Well, it does, but uh, even more for the yang than for the yin uh, is this uh, drive to make uh, their wife happy. And and you gave the same answer that I heard from thousands of men. I've never had them deviate from that answer. You said it's vital. It's very important. It's mm -hmm. uh, they say it's most it's important thing. It's a goal, and men it's are seriously goal-driven goal animals. Goal-oriented. That's right. In the UK, they say it's imperative, right? So uh, I, I, uh, so I embrace my goaliness. Yes, right, right. And, well, I think it's a wonderful quality. I mean, this has made me just really fall in love with men in general because um, from my perch now, where I get to be, I have a front row seat to thousands of students' uh, marriages, and I get to hear every day how um, he drives the old car so she can drive the new one, or um, how he takes on a second job so they can buy the bigger house, or uh, they move all the way across the country to be near her parents, or uh, there's just so much. Well, of, course, of course, sometimes the goal isn't really what she wants, but yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, say that again. Sometimes, Sometimes the goal, the goal like... that he perceives isn't really what she wants is part of the, oh, oh, yeah, that's true, the recipe. Too. She didn't really want the bigger house. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, she thought you know, she did, though. So. <laughs> that can be a problem, too. And um, that was something I used to do badly was um, I thought I was telling my husband what I wanted and he just didn't care. Um, but looking back, I had, there were some issues with that. Or like, sometimes like, men just don't hear it the way it's meant, uh, you know? I, 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 it could be, oh, God, you know, I feel like we don't have a ro enough room to store things here and da-da-da. And they might hear a bigger house there. But what she might actually be saying is, we really need to get rid of some stuff. Get rid of some stuff. Yeah. That's exactly right. Oh, that's a great point. Okay, so this brings me to this, like, tragic story of how I didn't know how to express my desires in a way that inspires, and now I do. And that's like a magic formula that I just want every woman to know. So I'm happy to share about that. But um, when before we were even married, my husband took us on, on a romantic getaway to Hawaii, which um, I was so excited. I thought, oh, we're gonna go uh, play on the beach. Can't wait to do that. But instead of saying what I wanted on the first day, I said, Hey, what, what do you want to do today? And he's like, let's go see a volcano. I was like, oh, a volcano, like, you know, but I didn't want to have a fight. I didn't want there to be any conflict. So I decided to just suck it up. I thought, well, I'll just go see this volcano, whatever. Uh, so we're on our way in the rental car and you can't see a volcano for a long time. It's just like little molten rocks on the side of the road. And um, I started to kind of get upset. I'm like, gosh, we could be on the beach right now, but instead we're going to see the stupid volcano. And he, I said, you know, is something wrong? And that's when I went, do you think this is fun? Because I don't think it's fun. I think it's stupid. And I wanted to go to the beach. And that's what I wanted to do. And 
so he saw a volcano all right i mean not the kind that he thought he was going to see and um i feel so sad for that earlier version of me that just didn't know how mm -hmm. to say what i wanted and of course if you can't say what you want you're never going to get what you want so you it, honor your own desires if the man is all about the yang about making her happy what's the woman all about what's the yang well we have certain superpowers that um we have Truth. several of them and Truth. what right women and have superpowers them, there's no doubt right? about that so, so do men, but I, is, I've noticed that my right, wife has some pretty amazing superpowers. That's right. And one of them is receptivity. Receptivity is a the essence of femininity. And it's what men are fundamentally attracted to is mm -hmm. us, um, receiving gifts, compliments, help, apologies, special treatment uh, graciously, which I know can sound kind of old fashioned, but uh, it's a uh, it's uh, like our desire combined with the ability and the willingness to receive becomes like a North star. I know this is, I certainly see this with my husband. We just went through a massive remodel, um, got a pool and everything else for our house. And um, it was all because I would, I said, I would love, and that's the formula, by the way, is to say what you would love. I think a lot of women, we think we're communicating what we would love, but no, um, I, I know for me, I used to say like, this kitchen is a disaster area. And I thought he was going to take off of, the couch. Of what I would and, love is an organized kitchen that has clear cooking spaces. And yeah, that makes perfect. Yeah, I just said, right? So, I mean, I don't think you could hear me at all when I was just complaining. It was like, blah, 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 blah. Like the Peanuts parents, right? Wow, 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 wow. But as soon as I said, I would love a clean kitchen, that's all I said. I would love a clean kitchen. He said, okay, I'll clean it. And he did. And that he's been doing it ever since. Sweet. Yeah, I like your husband. I, I like this guy. He's pretty good. He's awfully good. But it's not just my husband. We see this with husbands, you know, now that I've helped thousands of women fix their marriage, um, you know, we see that they get super motivated when they can see the North Star. If she's clear about what she desires and she expresses it uh, in the terms of, I would love, and then just a final outcome, not how it happens. So, so you might say, for example, I would love a clean kitchen. And the husband might say, okay, kids, hey, let's get these dishes into the dishwasher and clear off the table, right? He might, there, there's lots of ways to get things done. It's mm -hmm. and sometimes we get it attached to like, it should be done this way. <laughs> and husbands have a different point of view and that's uh, part of the attraction, right? It so, makes perfect sense. I, I, was, I was actually working with a couple just before this call uh, and they were really stuck in judgment and negativity. And when I got them to pause and breathe a little, I just said, what do you, what do you want? You know? And he said, I want to be respected. I want to be honored as a father, as a husband, as a son. Uh, they're religious. He said, as a child of the most high God, you know, and she said, I want to be heard. I want to be appreciated. I want to be acknowledged. I want him to see who I am. I want to be treated as an equal. And then when I asked them both, all that stuff aside, Tom wasn't really his name. What did you think about what Laura said? Oh, I want all those things for Laura. Laura, what did you think about what Tom said? Oh, he absolutely deserves those things. You know, so like when they were able to set aside the judgment and just speak in the positive about what they want or what they would love for the kitchen, you know, all of a sudden they were able to get on track. It makes perfect sense. Yes. Hey, um, yes. I, it sounds like this book is loaded with some great secrets um that can be yours at the click of a button how can people find your book laura doyle and how can people find you well the empowered wife is available on amazon of course or they can tune into the podcast the empowered wife podcast uh at our uh they can get uh, we have something really cool right now actually is the free adored wife roadmap which you can get at lauradoyle.org nice very nice um, and the question I ask everyone at the end, and I'm sorry it's the end because you are filled with uh, knowledge and wisdom. And I feel like um, I feel like I could get on a stage with you, honestly, or like we could just we, we could just go on tour together. Uh, I, but the question I ask everyone at the end, regardless of how I feel, is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Yeah, well, Rich, um, now that I have the marriage that I always wanted, even though I thought it was hopeless, 
I'm on a mission to end world divorce by making sure that as many women as possible can get their hands on the right secrets, you call them. And they really are secrets if the definition of a secret is that most women don't know about them. Uh, so that is, that's what I want my legacy to be. Uh, that, uh, yeah, that we end world divorce. Really interesting. This is why we could go on a stage together because my mission is to help parents to bring joy and resilience into their relationship and their, their family, which they like, they go, if you're getting divorced, it's harder to do that. Makes perfect That's sense. Right. I get it. Right. This is why we vibe. All right. Well, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure and, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Thank you so much, Rich. It's been great being on. Thanks for having me.